Indigenous Sites in the City of Monash, a guide for NAIDOC Week 2020. The information in this short guide has been prepared by Monash Public Library Service using information sourced from Monash City Council. It is not intended to be a definitive guide or history to these various locations. In the book Cattlemen to Commuters, author Susan Priestley states, Throughout this period of early settlers, the district's tribal Aborigines, the Boonarung, whose custom it had been to move silently and swiftly through the district on their seasonal hunting expeditions between the mountains and the sea, had lived peacefully among the settlers and their cattle. As long as the cattle grazed largely unfenced, their hunting patterns were only lightly disturbed, and they seem to have been readily accepted by most of the settlers. Priestley further adds that tribal life lost direction as elders died and few children were being born. By the late 1850s, the remnants of the Boonarung tribe seem to have settled on land in the Mordialic area. In recognition of the 150th anniversary of Victoria, a series of plaques were placed around the then city of Waverley. A directory of these historic markers is located in the forecourt outside the Glen Waverley Library. The name Boonarung has many different spellings, written as it was by European settlers and government officials as they heard it from the indigenous people. In historical records, there are 66 different spelling variations alone of this name. A young lawyer from Ireland, who later became Sir Edmund Barry of Sindal, had much sympathy for Aborigines who were camped on the outskirts of Melbourne. They were often in trouble with the law, and therefore he spent much time studying cases and defending them free of charge. Barry questioned the legal basis of British authority over Aborigines who were not citizens, and claimed that the evidence was dubious and circumstantial. Despite his best efforts, the two men were found guilty and subsequently hanged on 20th of January 1842, becoming the first people in Victoria to be legally executed. The distinctive shape of the scar on the tree was caused by the removal of a sheet of bark by members of the Kulin Nation, who lived in this part of Victoria for over 40,000 years. The tree had originally been located on Springvale Road in Glen Waverley, and was relocated due to road widening to Valley Reserve in 1965. On Friday, September the 16th, 2016, Mayor of the City of Monash, Councillor Jeff Lake, attended the launch of the new bollards to denote the scarred tree in Valley Reserve, Mount Waverley. As stated on one of the bollards, the tree is now protected by law. The spirit of the land artwork weighs about two and a half tonnes and is nine metres in length. The sculpture depicts a feather that references Bunjil the Creator, an important local indigenous creation story. In indigenous history, the feather is known as both delicate and strong and signifies the beginning of a new life. Councillor Mayle said the new artwork and preliminary landscaping works had given the reserve a much needed facelift. Thousands of people will drive past this fantastic piece of art every day. It will certainly make us think about the area's indigenous history and the importance of recognising the traditional owners of the land. The project was first proposed in 2008 by Oakley Ward councillors Stephen Demopoulos and Denise McGill. In June 2009, students from Mazano College were awarded first prize in an art competition that assisted in the development of the project brief and provided inspiration to the artist team. This plaque acknowledges the Kulin Nation having previously occupied these lands. Little information survives from the early European squatters and settlers in this area in relation to their contact with the indigenous communities. Some references, such as by author Susan Priestley, note that good relations occurred with some of the early squatters such as Reverend James Clough and Alexander Macmillan, son of John Macmillan of Scotchman's Creek Run, who often visited the Aboriginal camps, listening to their songs and learning some of their language. In 1841, Madeline wrote a letter to the editor of the Port Phillip Gazette 
in defence of the local indigenous community after it was reported in the newspaper that they had set fire to her property when in actual fact they had been helping her to put the fire out. It had also been noted that she was favourably disposed towards the indigenous peoples and was apparently liked by them in return. The plaque on the right hand side of this slide is an acknowledgement to both Madeline Scott and Thomas Napier and is located on the south side of High Street Road in Glen Waverley near the entrance to Napier Park. It is believed that Merv Mackay had travelled quite frequently to the northern regions of inland Australia and developed an interest in the original indigenous inhabitants. The placement of the sculpture at the school was supported by the school's art and technology department and was cast by the highly respected firm Artworks in Bronze. Ashwood High School was built in 1958 on the site where originally John Jordan's homestead, Summerhill, was located from about 1855 onward. In the book, Once There Was Jordanville, author Geoffrey Turnbull had noted that in the early days the Jordan family would frequently see Aborigines near their house, in the daytime and after dark. Ashwood was originally named Jordanville, and the name lives on in the name of the local railway station. In the spirit of reconciliation, we, the Congregation of St Luke's Uniting Church, acknowledge that the land on which our church stands is part of the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We respect the close spiritual and cultural ties of Aboriginal people to their land and commit ourselves to work for justice for Indigenous people. 2001 In the spirit of reconciliation, this parish acknowledges the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of this land. February 2010 According to the guide published by Monash University, the local indigenous peoples used various plants for their daily lives such as for food, medicine, canoes and their houses. Over thousands of generations they had gained a vast amount of knowledge on how to use the land's natural resources to enable them to live their lives. The most valuable plants were those with storage roots, as roots are available year round and can be protected by being in the ground. Each plant found in these gardens is labelled with its indigenous name, common name, botanical name and traditional uses. The chocolate lily was the floral emblem of the former city of Waverley and can be found in the gardens. The Mullum Mullum scar tree is listed as a tree of historical significance in the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Register. Although there has been some speculation that the name Black Flat the original name for Glen Waverley comes from the large amount of indigenous people who resided in the area, also mentioned in Wynne Hatwell's book Wandering Around Waverley. This claim cannot be verified. In partnership with Living Links, the City of Greater Dandenong, along with a project team comprised of several other councils and relevant stakeholders, has secured a grant to create a new arts trail over the next two years along the Dandenong Creek Working alongside both the Aboriginal people and the wider community, seven place-based pieces of art will be installed along a 22-kilometre stretch of the trail, which will include one piece of art in the city of Monash. For more information, go to livinglinks.com.au. For further reading on the Indigenous history of the city of Monash, these publications and webpages may be of interest to you. Many of the books mentioned here you will find on the catalogue of Monash Public Library Service. For more information on the history of the City of Monash, including its Indigenous heritage, you may wish to contact the following organisations. We hope you enjoyed this short presentation. Thank you.